Good morning. Welcome to Williams. Uh, this is the first time we've been able to gather indoors for family weekend since 2019. Uh, and I can tell you on behalf of two of our three panelists who did this outdoors about this time of the morning last year, <laughs> that uh, it's warmer. It's warmer in here. I'm Rob White. I am the director of parent and family programs, the man behind the family Facebook uh, curtain, and as I tell your students, dean of your mom and dad. Um, <laughs> Now, we have a chance to hear from the people at the heart of the Williams Matter, professors who teach your students. To my immediate left is Assistant Professor of History Tyron Stewart. Uh, to Tyron's left is Associate Professor of Music Karina Campbell. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that Tyron is actually, actually representing his 100 faculty members in Division II, which is the Social Scientists. And Karina, again, who's uh, associate professor of music, is going to be representing Division I, which is Humanities and the Arts. And to Karina's left is associate professor of Geosciences, Jose Constantine, who will speak on behalf of Division III, the Sciences and the Mathematics. Um, each of our panelists will give a brief overview of their third of the Williams uh, curriculum. An interesting challenge, you know, six minutes for an entire swath of human knowledge. Uh, then we'll open it up for questions which they hope you have and are eager to answer. We'll let Tyron begin and let's give them all a warm welcome. Thank you, Rob, and thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, as Rob mentioned, last year it was cold. It's crisp this morning, so I'm uh, very delighted that we are indoors. Um, I want to welcome you all again uh, to Williams College. Um, I'm certainly uh, excited to see so many out on this morning. Um, it shows a level of enthusiasm. Uh, I think it's enthusiasm that reflects the kind of uh, eagerness that your students bring into our classroom each day. So I, I really appreciate you all being here. Um, as Rob mentioned, I represent Division II, broadly understood as the social sciences. And it's kind of difficult to sort of encapsulate what the different branches of the social science uh, mean in concert with one another, but uh, I'll try to do my best. So you can think of, so, so first of all, the social sciences include um, core disciplines that many of you are familiar with, uh, sociology, anthropology, political science, uh, economics, women, gender, and sexuality studies, um, my department, history. Um, it also includes or houses uh, many of the interdisciplinary programs. So programs like Africana studies, uh, Latina, Latino studies, Jewish studies, leadership studies, global studies. And you can kind of imagine that what the social sciences have uh, in common uh, is a kind of way of thinking about the way that human beings uh, construct uh, economies and governments and ideas and institutions and structures. Uh, sometimes they do this knowingly, oftentimes it's by accident, right? It's unknowingly. And yet they are affected uh, regardless of how these institutions, ideas, governments, economies and structures are developed. And so that's really what uh, I do in, as a historian, but what my colleagues in economics or in religion do, right? Thinking about the construction of, uh, or the idea of God, or thinking about uh, capitalism, right? Uh, or thinking of, in political science about liberalism and uh, all that it entails in its different uh, iterations or embodiments. What's interesting, I think, for me, and, and you may hear this echoed among my colleagues on stage, is that Williams places our programs into different divisions, right? And division is a very interesting word because on the one hand, you can sort of recognize how these academic disciplines are separated into uh, different parts, right? So language and the arts, mathematics and sciences, and of course, the social studies. And yet, I tend to believe, this is now my third year here at the college, and I tend to believe that there's a lot of continuity, uh, certainly collaboration, also collegiality between what we do 
across multiple disciplines and certainly across multiple divisions, right? So I'll, I'll kind of give you uh, uh, some quick examples. So this semester, I teach two courses. One is black history is labor history. I'm a labor political uh, historian. Um, and I also teach a course on race passing. It's called Crossing the Color Line. And it's really not only race passing, but uh, passing broadly considered, right? So thinking about different ways that individuals cross boundaries to reinvent themselves, uh, to craft new lives, to shape new identities, things of that nature. And when I think about continuity, right? So early on in the semester, we're reading literature from the 19th century on enslavement and its relationship between to labor and also the making of modern capitalism. And one day, the students and I are having a discussion about the materiality of everyday life. And we sort of veer off into thinking about what it means to utilize torture, right, uh, to drive economic efficiency or to drive labor production. And at some point, I mentioned to the students an article uh, written by uh, Columbia uh, professors, uh, doctors Veronica Barcelona and Jacqueline Taylor on the relationship between trauma and DNA methylation. So that is to suggest that uh, traumas that are experienced can essentially rewrite one's DNA code. And during the discussion, one of my students uh, was able to elaborate uh, in a way that was useful for uh, her classmates on DNA methylation and epigenomics based on a class she's taken in molecular biology. And so even though this is a history course and we're thinking about the sort of historical ways that trauma played out amid the period of enslavement, here you have a student who is also able to invite into that conversation other ways of thinking about it through her expertise in molecular biology. So that's one example of just ways to think about continuity. I also think about continuity in this sense. So in a passing course, right, I introduce students to primary sources. Certainly we introduce uh, them to historical text. Um, but sometimes we, uh, every now and then, have to read outside of the field of history, especially for a topic like passing, where there's, a, there's not really a robust archive. And so here students are also reading beyond those historical texts and uh, primary sources, um, books like Nella Lawson's Passing, right? Which is uh, certainly something you might encounter in Division I in an English course. Or we're reading James Weldon Johnson's Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. I also think in the context of collaboration, right? So what does collaboration mean for us? Um, I think faculty members get an opportunity to collaborate each and every day. Um, but I think about last year when a student in art history, which is also in Division I, um, came to me, uh, she was writing a thesis, and she wanted to think about uh, the body in its context of labor, but she was doing so uh, looking at art from the 18th and 19th century. And so there's collaborations among faculty members, but certainly uh, we get to interact with students in that same way. Um, and then I think about collegiality, and it's when you know everyone when you walk into a room. It's last week when I'm at the Windows on, uh, Windows on Williams event, and uh, many of my faculty colleagues are there. And so you see Sarah Jacobson from economics, you see Norris Samstrom from psychology, um, Matt Carter from biology, Clinton Williams. You see others who you readily recognize, and those same uh, instances in which you can build relationships with faculty members exist among students. So it's not only how we engage them in the classroom, but it's when you can go out to dinner uh, with my tutorial students uh, and have dinner and discussion and just build meaningful relationships that uh, quite often are not built at many institutions uh, for a variety of reasons, sometimes due to size, but um, there are other factors as well. And so. There's a lot of continuity, there's a lot of collaboration, uh, there's certainly collegiality among these divisions. And I think what it does then is it helps us to really shape uh, very uh, intellectual and social connections. I mean, I think that's the key, that students are able to build uh, meaningful connections across the college, across the campus, um, connections that I believe are lasting. So it's not just that we introduce them to ideas, uh, certainly, uh, Students are able to major and uh, develop concentrations in Division II, 
but it's really about the ways in which we orient them, orient them to thinking about how they are connected across the college to other divisions and students who are learning in a variety of ways across disciplines. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hi, um, welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to see you here. Thank you for getting up early and being here and taking this time to learn a little bit about um, some of the aspects of your, your son or daughter's experience that you can't get on a college tour or these other sorts of, um, yeah, these other sorts of uh, venues and, and opportunities that you have here. Um, so my name is Karina Campbell. I am uh, in the music department. I'm an ethnomusicologist um, by, by training. And so that is a combination of uh, investigating music through a combination of musical um, strategies and techniques and also strategies and methodologies uh, borrowed from the social sciences in particular anthropology, but also um, a variety of, of um, other disciplines as well. So thinking about the social meaning and context of music. Um, so this semester I'm teaching a course on music and global circulation. Um, I'm also teaching a class on music nationalism and popular culture. And so I, I take a lot of joy in being able to think about really big issues through the particular lens of music. Um, I'm here representing Division One. So Division One, you have the arts, visual arts, performing arts. You also have languages, including English, but also um, various language skills. Um, so, so for me, I think one of the things that's interesting, um, and and maybe a good thing to keep in mind, especially thinking about these themes of you know, interdepartmental and interdivisional kinds of dialogue. Um, ethnomusicology, you know, in, in a different sort of configuration, I might very well be in a division to, you know, I could be in an area studies program or something like that. So even though you might have departments that have a particular kind of divisional blueprint, I think that that's a useful model to know that you may have, uh, your student, your, your, your kid may have a class that's in a particular division that just by nature of its, its material is going to extend beyond those, those divisional confines. And in fact, there's a lot of cross-listing that happens. I cross-list a lot of courses and sometimes they're within division one, for instance, with the dance department. Um, and sometimes they're with women, gender, and sexuality studies or they're with an area studies program. So, so there is this really uh, sort of vibrant uh, exchange in between these divisions. But when I'm thinking about division one uh, and what might be useful for you to, to consider about what might be particular about a division one kind of classroom experience, um, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is um, where you, depending on the course and what they're talking in a given unit, um, you may have some courses or there are instances where you have right and wrong answers in some instances where you don't. But especially in Division I, there are a lot of um, challenges and um, some really wonderful opportunities for growth that have to do with going beyond right and wrong answers. Um, so I can give you an example or two from classes that I've taught in the past um, or that I'm currently teaching. Um, one of my favorite assignments in my uh, class that I co, uh, that I cross list with women, gender, and sexuality studies is gender and sexuality in music. And the midterm that I give students for that course, I give them um, a well-known popular song. Um, so it might be um, I Fall to Pieces by Patsy Cline, if any of you know that, that particular song. I give this to them, I give them sheet music in case they read music, I give them an audio recording of it. And their assignment is, okay, take this song and through whatever means available to you, make it mean something else. <laughs> and you can do that through video, you can do that through changing the lyrics, you can make a different arrangement, <laughs> you can do whatever your, your creativity and your, your ideas lead you to do. 
Um, so so uh, that's, that's a, an assignment that a lot of students find very challenging um, because it's so wide open. There are so many different ways that that can go. But ultimately, when everybody gets together and they share this, it's, um, you know, time and time again, people say that that's one of these more memorable experiences they've had in the class because it's a chance to really engage um, and, and to think about what I think is at the heart of Division I, which is um, these, these processes and methods of, of expression and communication. Uh, so those certainly do extend beyond other, other divisions, um, but, but that I think is a really important component of it. Um, the last thing I'll say here just about Division I is that I think we're very, very fortunate here at Williams uh, to have all kinds of other resources that may extend beyond the classroom uh, that we, we as teachers can draw upon um, to sort of bridge those divides. So for instance, um, over at the Williams College Museum of Art, there are a lot of opportunities um, to bring the visual arts into your learning, whether it's in Division I or also within the other divisions as well. But especially, you know, in the, the arts and languages side, there are so many, so many opportunities to do that. Also with the Clark Art Institute right off the hill, um, but also, you know, in thinking about, I don't know if any of you were at the Berkshire Symphony concert last night, uh, that there are, you know, musicians of, of that caliber that, that are, you know, available to teach students in private lessons, but also in addition to that, that they're able to have these sorts of um, experiences where if you're taking the class, the symphony, you can think about it and then you can go and hear a concert of a, sym of a symphonic concert at a really um, impressive and, and high level. Um, I know one of my colleagues teaches a composition class and we have visitors coming into the music department who are, you know, well-known string quartets, for instance, or contemporary music ensembles. And they will actually uh, read through pieces uh, that composition students have created, which is such a, you know, really marvelous opportunity for them. So those are some examples of the ways that the classroom experience is also connected with all of these things beyond. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave it there. Thanks. I think I'm on. I am on. That's great. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you. Um, what's tough about being the third person to speak is whatever prepared marks I had are now uh, useless because of the amazing people that I'm sitting beside here. But I'm just going to choose two themes that Tyron and Karina um, both shared with you. One on this idea of, of cross-disciplinary sort of experiences, cross-divisional experiences, and the other one on, on resources. Um, one of the things that, I've been here for seven years now, which is uh, making me feel a little bit old, but uh, I'm okay with that. Um, one of m my sort of experiences of Williams is that this is a place that doesn't like to compromise. And you can interpret that in a number of different ways. But I, I, in my experience of it, it's, it's been generally uh, positive and inspiring or inspirational and impactful. Uh, and when I say we don't like to compromise, you've got amazing faculty who really uh, love their, their discipline. They love scholarship. They love research. And that's not something that they want to give up on, but they also love teaching and exciting uh, young people, students, undergraduates, which is quite unique um, in, in higher education settings in some ways, about their disciplines. And, and for me, that's where magic happens. That's where truly transformative experiences occur uh, here. In Division Three, which represents the natural sciences and mathematics and statistics, we're the smallest of the divisions, but I, I, I like to joke that we punch well above our weight. Uh, so we are disciplines that include computer science, mathematics and statistics, uh, biology, chemistry, psychology, geosciences, astronomy, uh, physics. Um, I would say at least half of the students who graduate from Williams, one of their majors is in the, the Division Three fields. And that reflects, I think, uh, a real desire uh, by our students to engage, not just in the natural sciences and, and mathematics and statistics, but this understanding that this world of ours is changing 
and it's changing in ways that affects all of us. No matter where you are on this planet, we are experiencing some big things. And our students wanna engage in those problems. They wanna participate in what potential solutions might look like. And that is incredibly exciting to be a part of, to, to be a witness to that, to that energy. You can see the result of that interest and the tremendous investment that we're seeing on the Division Three side of, side of campus, the two uh, state-of-the-art uh, science facilities that we have, the Hopper Science Hall and the Wackenheim uh, Science Center. Um, incredible spaces to work, incredible spaces to learn. Uh, one of the things that I think makes the Division Three side of campus a little bit unique is our commitment to experiential learning, right? For us, um, it's really important that the students have a good experience in lectures and, and can learn through uh, discussion and debate. But they also need to learn how to do stuff. And that do stuff involves, you know, most of our courses has, have students in laboratories learning on, learning how to pipette, developing those fine motor skills in their hands, which is incredibly difficult to do. Learning how to code, learning how to be outside and to collect observations about this world that we live in. Um, so they're learning constantly about ways of doing things, uh, which is, I, for me, is, is quite exciting. Um, Part of that commitment means that the college has dedicated resources to students being able to, from year one, your student right now, some of you uh, have, probably have students in this room that are working as research assistants. And we're not talking about being a research technician, we're talking about from the very first semester, they're here, they're in the laboratory, or working alongside a professor, trying to solve some complicated problem. And that experience repeats itself from one semester into the next. Uh, we dedicate tremendous resources to provide 200 summer uh, research internships, we'd call them, on, uh, on campus. We have about 200 students that stay on campus for nine weeks. Uh, they live here for free, they get a stipend, but it gives them a chance to even think more deeply about a science or, or, or a mathematical problem. It's incredible. And it's one of the reasons why in the sciences for a tiny college like ours, you know, we produce more PhDs in the sciences for our size than any other school in the country. And nothing really compares. Um, and that's, that for me is tremendous um, for someone who uh, uh, is still, I, I'm going to say, relatively new to this, to this space. On the cross-disciplinary, cross-divisional experiences, uh, when I arrived here, um, my wife was here, she would, she would uh, enjoy me admitting this to you all, but I was an arrogant person. I thought I knew everything there was to know about, about this climate change problem. But I got invited to be a part of something that Williams is also committed to, this Williams Mystic Maritime Studies program, where we take students from all across the country and they live in Mystic, Connecticut, and they experience what I think, some of, one of the most intensely liberal arts experiences that exist anywhere. Um, I was invited to go down to Louisiana as a part of one of their field seminars. And I arrived there, again, thinking of myself as this expert, and I left completely humbled. Because I was meeting people and I had met people, members of indigenous communities whose ancestors are being washed away by storm surges. I met members of the African American community in, in New Orleans that are still reeling from the impacts of Hurricane Katrina members of Cajun Americans, you know, white working class communities along the coast that are just struggling to survive day to day. And I came back to this space humbled and determined to use the resources that we have at our disposal. And I'm not just talking about, you know, financial resources, but the people, right? We have tremendous talent on this campus and we can use that talent to help communities um, in need. And, and that's what I've committed a lot of my teaching towards, towards doing and a lot of my research. And I also committed myself to crossing Main Street and learning because this climate change problem isn't a science problem. It's a people problem. It's a social sciences problem. It's a humanities problem. And it, it takes all of us. And that, that's what I did. I think I see Mr. McQueenie in, in, in the audience, and he was there last, yesterday afternoon at a, a panel discussion that our Department of the Geosciences helped uh, um, sponsor. And there were four human geographers and environmental historians thinking about getting it, challenging us uh, on ways that we think about history and think about our uh, presence in, in, in places and space. Um, and it's ref a reflection of, I think, a commitment, certainly by myself and many of my colleagues in Division Three. To, to learn 
from the tremendous people we have on this campus, both faculty and student alike. Um, so I, it's such a pleasure to have you here, and I think what we'll do is, is open it up to any questions that you might have of us. And we might need Rob's help, I'm not sure, but he's lurking in the distance. He's retiring this year, which is really great news for him, but sad news for us, it is. And, 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 and should we, I don't know, I'm tempted to embarrass him, he's there in the corner. But I want to thank you, Rob, for his tremendous years and years and years of being, yes. The dean, the dean of mom and dads, that's, that's, our, that's our dean. Any questions? I think someone in the back has a question at the last room. Hi, no, th thank you so much for a wonderful panel. I just wanted to check um, if you have a, um, a child uh, in, um, say, Division One or Two, the humanities, but they're interested in the mystic program. Um, and, you know, how, how, do you, how do you get that uh, to work? Uh, and any guidance on that? I, I can speak a little bit, I guess, to the mystic program. So the mystic program, um, students don't have a, a lot of selection of courses, and I think that's purposeful. So every student ends up taking a course in maritime literature, they take a course in maritime history, they take a uh, natural science course, either in ecology or oceanography, um, they take a, a course on uh, environmental law, focused on sort of a, a, you know, maritime issues. And because students, regardless of their background, are in the same physical space, trying to break down the same texts, um, trying to make sense of discussion and history and presence and futures, uh, that that experience, I think, appeals to so many different kinds of students. And they leave that experience, you know, um, with this renewed vigor, you know, to challenge big, big problems. So I, I would say uh, the program as it's constructed is a space for, for all kinds of students, regardless of their interests or backgrounds. Um, and it's there to, you know, bring those interests together in, I think, unique and exciting ways. I would just add, um you know, I, I, do, I do think that the, Mystic, the Mystic program and other programs that we have that allow students to leave the Williamstown campus, there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, and I think that a lot of these possibilities are, you know, are there for students regardless of their intended major, regardless of what division they are, they are focused in. Um, but what's important is to have really good communication in the year leading up, just to make sure that you have a plan, right, for your intended major or, or where you think you're heading. And, you know, we do have a number of students who double major in here in, in the college. And so it's, it's common for people to have to think about, um, you know, one set of major requirements in dialogue with other experiences. So it is possible, but it's always a good idea in advance of that to have some real conversations with um, the, their advisor uh, for, for the particular student to really reach out and make sure that they have a plan of how everything's going to come together. I'll just add really quickly um, something to think about uh, and something to uh, encourage your students to think about. So the Williams Mystic program has a separate admissions process for students with uh, sophomore, junior, and senior standing. And uh, they submit transcripts and uh, writing samples and personal statements and things of that nature. But one of the things that I believe is fundamentally important that will allow students to pursue uh, the Mystic program uh, is leaving enough space between what they're majoring in, their you know, initial major, uh, and opportunities to continue to explore across divisions and also within the Mystic program. Uh, a lot of our students double major. Um, I think uh, at last I uh, looked, the, the, the number was something like 43% graduate um, with uh, two major or, or degrees in two, uh, within two majors. And that's wonderful. I, I think it's excellent. Sometimes it's necessary, right? But I also think that when you uh, focus on a single major, then it allows opportunities then to explore a program like uh, the Mystic program. So I think, I think that's something to keep in mind as they're navigating the process, um, as they're moving forward uh, in their enrollment here, uh, to consider uh, what it might mean 
not to pursue that uh, second or third major, but to you know take a chance on a program like uh, Mystic that I think uh, Jose uh, uh, is. I, I think it's transformative. I think the experience they'll get there uh, will look uh, like completely different, completely different, even from their experience on this campus. I think uh, you know in terms of the opportunity to engage with people who are not just uh, you know, academics, but as Jose uh, mentioned, uh, from indigenous communities, African Americans, just a variety of individuals, I think that's critically important. And so if you want your uh, child to have that experience, I think one thing would be to encourage them then to consider uh, what uh, the alternative of a double major might look like. Could you speak a bit more about the uh, summer research opportunities you mentioned about specifically around how it, how it works from an application perspective and all that? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, so far, my experience has been is if a student is interested in, in this opportunity, it's theirs for them, you know? So, uh, and, and I think that speaks to, again, how, you know, important this is to the Williams College experience to make sure students have a chance to deeply engage in scholarship. Uh, it's not just unique, to, I shouldn't say it's, it's not unique to the natural sciences. There's an equivalent in the Division I and Division II programs so students can stay on campus and, and engage in scholarship over probably similar nine weeks of the summer. Um, you know, what I would encourage, you know, your students to do, and I'm sure they're already doing it, is, is to be in conversation with faculty whose research is of interest to them. Um, and have conversations about potential opportunities to start working now as a research assistant if their schedule allows. If not, you know, those conversations will likely lead to, you know, conversations about the summer. And um, it's through those conversations that a faculty member will submit the application. So the student doesn't have to do anything. The, the faculty member will notify um, the college or the, the institute that's in charge of this. It's called the the Science Center, um, but to notify the Science Center that there's this student who's interested in this project, um, and we would like uh, support for this student for nine weeks. And, you know, it's been an incredible success. Um, my, what I tell my students, the, their summer after their first year is a great year to take advantage of this program. Uh, I then tell my students that at the end of their second year, boy, wouldn't it be great to go see what the world looks like outside of Williams and take advantage of other research opportunities that are out there. The National Science Foundation on, on my side of the fence um, funds a program called Research Experience for Undergraduates and they're amazing, truly, truly. I, I, I'm a product of one of them uh, programs all across the country. So, you know, into the second year, go see what the world looks like and then, uh, and then when they come back, um, then we're, we're really excited about thinking about thesis work and, and preparing for that, that final year on campus. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing kind of what things look like from the perspective of a professor. Um, I, I could pinch myself. I'm, I'm ready to sign up. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I guess I'm really interested in learning more about double majors. This wasn't something that I really recall from when I was going through kind of college, and it does seem like it's something that's more common and so much is different about college. Maybe it's it's even different than what I imagine it to be. Um, and I guess I'm wondering what some of the rationale or benefits of a double major is, and also to your point, kind of what maybe some of the costs of it are, and how do you help students think through that decision? I guess I'll uh, start, and I, I want to kind of come back to my last statement because I don't want to make it seem as if I was sliding double majors. I think it's, uh, <laughs> I think there's utility with double majoring. Um, you know, Williams is a very unique space because I don't remember, and I'm dating myself here uh, in college, uh, you know, one major was tough enough, right? Uh, two majors, certainly difficult. Three majors, like uh, bananas. But here's the, what, what I think is going on. I think our students have a unique understanding of the ways in which uh, various disciplines are in conversation with each other, right? Um, now, there's something practical to note about Williams. Williams does not have minors. We have concentrations. Um, so like Africana studies, Jewish studies, uh, fields of that nature, students can concentrate. And so in that particular case, they will have a major in another discipline, okay? 
Um, outside of just thinking about it practically, um, here's, I, I, I guess, a good way to, you know, sort of frame what I think students are seeing. If you are a history major and you are interested in economic history, right, um, then a, a major in history uh, is useful, but so is a major in economics or in political economy. That's one example. Um, you may have an art historian um, who's interested in the environment and, you know, sort of placing those two into relationship with each other. That student might also then pursue a um, major in environmental studies, but also they may pursue a major in art history. And you can also, if I'm not mistaken, you also can pursue a concentration in environmental study. The point here is that I think it's just a way, again, of developing a sense of continuity, right? And, and seeing the sort of collaborative way in which disciplines tend to be in conversation with each other. The other thing I think, uh, sort of in a final analysis, um, I was looking at a study recently uh, involving Williams College. And the fact that, you know, students typically do not always uh, pursue careers related to their majors. And I, so I, what, I, what I think is also going on is a way in which students are shaping their own sense of viability, right, beyond their matriculation here, so that you can uh, have multiple paths and multiple opportunities that you can pursue just as you're pursuing uh, multiple curricular paths while a student on this campus. I'll just add to that um, to, to sort of um, reiterate that, that oftentimes interests from multiple fields do come together in a really interesting and compelling way. So music cognition, for instance, um, would be another example of something that you would be best suited by taking a fair number of courses, both in the music department um, and in, you know, in cognitive science and, and related fields, psychology and whatnot. Um, it also, I think, is worth saying that sometimes there's a student who has a passion and an idea of what their career is going to be, and they're separate. <laughs> and that's also fine, you know? We have, um, in the music department, so many people who have an idea where, they're, where they would like to head in their career, um, but they also just couldn't live without playing the violin. You know, it's been a huge part of, of their experience, and they want to keep that going, and it's, it's something that they get a lot out of. So that's another thing that often does happen, that, that one will have, you know, they, they feed students in different kinds of ways um, that can be, you know, equally important in the long term, even though they're, they're headed in different kinds of trajectories. One quick follow-up, because I think something Karina said is important, which is to consider how students uh, might maintain an interest in, just say, playing a violin, but want to major in uh, geosciences, right? Uh, I think the college also nurtures this, right? Because students have to take courses across multiple divisions. So there are three uh, course required. We don't have uh, core course requirements, but students take three courses in division one, three courses in division two, three courses in division three. And so oftentimes uh, they develop very strong interests and strong ties to uh, those courses and of course to uh, the relevant disciplines. But why don't you talk a bit more about tutorials, mm -hmm. just a little bit more, more about those programs and how, like how you actually do that and you like to develop a relationship with the faculty, have this in the course catalog, does that work? I have never taught a tutorial, and that's the sad truth of my life. But so I'm going to look, I'm going to, I'm looking forward to this answer. <laughs> Tyron, this is you. Uh, you as well. <laughs> okay, so I'm teaching a tutorial. Um, and, uh, and it's the tutorial on uh, race passing. Um, and here's what I think. Uh, there are multiple reasons why a faculty member would be attracted to this campus and this college. Of course, because it has immense resources, opportunities for collaboration, uh, first-rate students, right? Um, the tutorial, I think, is another unique part of that, uh, that appeal, right? Uh, so in a tutorial, it's adapted from Oxford. Oxford, uh, their interactions are between uh, one faculty member, one instructor, 
and a student. Here uh, it is two students generally. Um, I've seen tutorials where it can take on three students and kind of uh, be a little bit more non-traditional. But what I think is uh, particularly vibrant about it, right, is it's an opportunity uh, for students to have a, a kind of autonomy. They, they do not have uh, in a lecture course, certainly in a seminar, right? Students are driving their own learning. And in my tutorial, what I typically do, uh, I provide students the materials that they need to engage over a week time. Um, one student comes into the course, writes a major paper, the other student critiques that major paper. And then we sit in the office and there's a, a very fruitful exchange between uh, the two on their ideas, the development of the ideas, they walk kind of through the anatomy of their paper. Um, and then I get to engage with them. Um, and in the best tutorials, I say nothing, which is actually a pretty wonderful uh, thing to just sit back and watch students uh, in that process of self-discovery and intellectual discovery. But I think, you know, I came away from my first tutorial last year feeling like every course in the social sciences should be a tutorial. Um, now that's not practical, but it would be wonderful um, just because there's a certain level of enthusiasm that students bring to those courses, uh, and they can all take them, right? It's, it, I mean, there are tutorials across disciplines, across divisions, um, and I, I think they're, I, I just think they're, you know, you used the word earlier, transformative. I think they're particularly transformative. The other thing I'll say about them is that they really shape our pedagogy. And the reason I say that is because you learn from how students are learning from each other and how they're instructing each other. You also get the opportunity to engage in something that we have, uh, not just relevant to tutorials, but any course, which are teaching roundtables. And last year I did a teaching roundtable on tutorials with colleagues not only in the social sciences, but also in division one and division three. And it was just a very unique way of talking about each of our encounters in those tutorials in the ways in which students are really shaping uh, the way we teach them. So I, I, I strongly encourage students uh, to take tutorials if they uh, desire. Just a follow up though with that, how, how do they actually identify them? Are they listed in the course catalog? Do they have relationships? Do they have pre existing relationships with a faculty member? How does that work? Yes, that's actually a good question, and I apologize for not kind of giving uh, a sense of how they actually work. Um, so they are listed in the course catalog. Tutorials are capped at 10 students, and that can be a challenge, right? Um, and so oftentimes relationships matter, um, but they matter with all of our courses. This year I had 23 students uh, registered during the pre-registration process for my tutorial. So that meant, you know, there's gonna be some attrition. You have to remove 13 students from the course. And that can be a very difficult process. And what I typically rely on, I mean, certainly relationship building matters, um, but all students have the opportunity to reach out to a professor, express their interest. Um, there are different ways that uh, my colleagues go about the process. Uh, some have students uh, fill out questionnaires and then from that uh, determine who's going to enroll in the course. Uh, some do it sort of more arbitrarily and uh, some do it based on the major, right? If you're a major or not. My tutorial, so we have two types of tutorials. There are 100 level tutorials and then you have the advanced uh, tutorials at the 400 level. So 100 level tutorials are generally open to first year students and also uh, sophomores, um, sometimes with uh, permission from the instructor. And then 400 level tutorials tend to be uh, uh, housed within the major. So for students who are pursuing 400 level tutorials, I think it's a little, I'm not gonna say easier, but you, there's not the level of competition across the campus. Whereas for those 100 level tutorials, especially those that have the writing skills requirement or meet the writing skills requirement, there tend to be a lot of competition. And um, I think the one downside is students sometimes have you know, an eagerness to take a course, a tutorial, and they might not ever get a chance to take it um, if they are removed from uh, that course during the pre-registration process. Thank you. Never. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, yesterday at the career section um, talk, uh, they said that the professors are quite involved in uh, 
supporting their students uh, and uh, preparing them for grad school. Uh, so could you talk a little bit more about the kinds of things um, that uh, you engage with to prepare the students for uh, academics uh, further on beyond? Well, I think I can speak for um, Div 1. I think this might um, have some connections with Div 2 as well. I think one of the main strengths across uh, the individual departments is that we actually get to know students very, very well. So I think if there's any one thing that, that helps <laughs> is that we can get a sense of, on an individual level, um, what what a particular student's strengths are we you know so in guiding them into programs that might meet what they're looking for um, there's the possibility to to have really in-depth kinds of guidance and mentorship on those sorts of levels and to really think it through about you know on, on a kind of broad spectrum sort of way what makes sense for this particular student what are their goals in this kind of program um, are there other things they might want to consider as well or in addition um, so I, I think you know as as there are, you know if it's a pre-med track or something like that I, I know things are a little bit different and we do also have a pre-med advisor uh, here on campus who can help students very particularly with those sorts of of um, issues and make sure that they're in as good a shape for applying for pre-med programs as, or for medical schools as, as they can be. Um, but you know, in terms of the students that I know who have gone on in the social sciences and also in music, that's one of the big things is that also they've had opportunities, regardless of what uh, what their particular department is, there are opportunities for them to be able to show their original thought and their own individual contributions. I think that's another thing that because of the size of the college and, and because of the kinds of interactions that happen, there are in general a lot of opportunities for students to emerge from their undergraduate years with some sort of body of work that demonstrates how they might propel themselves into grad school quickly um, when students declare their major um, they go from having a college-wide advisor to having an advisor within a major um, and so beginning in their junior years uh, that major advisor uh, will have uh, multiple conversations with a student and try to figure out uh, what the long-term interests are what their aspirations are and how their aspirations fit within the major um, I think one of the things we do in history and this is done in uh, you know, I think just about every academic discipline here, we have the thesis program. Mm -hmm. And students apply to the thesis program. They uh, write, uh, like, it's exceptional. It, I, like, it's amazing what your students are able to produce, um, especially under the time constraints. It's not as if they get uh, course releases uh, for their, I almost feel like they should with the amount of research that they're doing. But they write these incredible theses and, um, and some go on to uh, pursue it um, as a part of graduate study. Um, I had, a stu as a matter of fact, the last two students uh, I worked with, one um, ended up at Oxford and the other is at uh, Princeton um, pursuing PhDs. And I think it's a very, uh, I think it's a useful program to have because it introduces them to that sort of rigor and it allows them to uh, be very hands-on with history. So it's not just you know, learning ideas, but it's actually you know, doing original research. And uh, those projects oftentimes are what they develop at the graduate school level. I think we're probably nearing the end. I was looking for the cutoff sign. I've got the thumbs up sign. But I'll, I'll give you the answer to this question from the Division Three Natural Sciences side. Uh, you know, given that for us, experiential learning is, is paramount, and your student may be working in a laboratory now. They're gaining real skills, uh, and, 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 and in, you know, they don't compromise, no one compromises in that development of those skills. In addition, um, and this might be a difference between the divisions, thesis students do get a course release in Division Three, so that they can really dedicate time to, to their theses. Uh, Tyron mentioned the uh, advisors that your student has now, and they'll get a new one once they declare a major. But when they're working with a researcher, oftentimes that researcher is a more important advisor. They've been working with them for one, two, three, potentially four years. 
um, helping, you know, in, in conversation with that student, thinking about what their career or academic trajectories might look like um, in the natural sciences collaboration is absolutely vital. And one of the things that we uh, make sure our students have the ability to do is to go to conferences, you know, academic meetings where they can present their research, meet other students, and meet potential graduate school advisors. And that's something we take very seriously. And we send students uh, to major meetings all across the country. The upcoming meeting of, uh, I'm sure it's on your calendar, the American Geophysical Union, uh, which is uh, in Chicago. We're sending students there just for that purpose. You know, they're thinking about grad school. They're in a, at a time when meeting and learning about programs and meeting advisors is, is absolutely crucial. So that's, you know, something we take very seriously. And it sounds like it's true amongst all the disciplines. I've been given the thumbs up, and I want to see if you have any other questions. Um, or there is one, sorry, sorry. Maybe we have time for one more. We're looking at Rob, who's looking at his watch, and he's judging, maybe. Okay, uh, my question is with respect to writing skills courses, how it differs from other courses, and whether students are advised to take just one or take two of these at the same time. That's a great question. Um, so writing skills, an important thing to know about that is it doesn't have to do with how many pages they're writing. It has more to do with the process that the course is encouraging, the kind of feedback that they're going to get from the instructor. Um, so oftentimes it involves multiple drafts or it might have, you know, um, assignments that are targeted towards different aspects of the craft of writing. So um, those are marked on the course catalog. Students can see them. Whether it's a good idea to take many or one at a time, a lot of that depends on the particular student's relationship to writing. Um, if this is something that, that they really want to focus on, that, that takes them a lot of time, um, you know, it's good for them to know themselves and to keep that in mind as they're trying to figure out how to parse their courses. Other students, you know, they're enthusiastic about the various topics that are um, in these writing skills courses and, and they, they appear to manage it fine. But just as, you know, with lab courses or these other things, there's, there's an idea, very different kinds of learning that happen in a given semester. So given what a particular student's challenge areas might be versus their strengths, it's always good if you're going into a challenge area to think about how you can really um, create space so that you can do your best work. And really briefly, just briefly, there are two, right, the, the college sees uh, developing strong writing skills as uh, crucial. So there are two writing skills courses they have to take during their time here. And I would almost encourage uh, them not to be taken simultaneously um, because it's, it's extremely intense and um, they'll have the opportunity to take another writing skills course at a later date. So that's it. I know that we're now at the, at the end and I, and I wanted to, to say if you, if you have any other questions. Oh, well, we we'll wait, hold questions, and I think we'll maybe have time to hang around and, and be in conversation with you. Um, but if you have uh, questions, you're more than welcome to send them via email to us. I think we'd all be happy to to answer them for you. I've, my eldest child is 13, so the, imagining this child as a college student is like science fiction to me. So I don't know what your feelings are, but we, we are very grateful for all the tremendous work that you have done as parents, and we're, we're grateful for, for you entrusting your 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 student with us. And thank you, and we hope you're having a, a great weekend. Take care. Yeah.